Hey guys and welcome to Canaman TV. My name is Conor McLeod and in this exclusive interview I get the chance to chat with Hannah Deacon. Hannah has been campaigning for greater patient access to medicinal cannabis for several years. Beginning with researching a way to treat her son Alfie's intractable epilepsy, this led Hannah on a journey through the endocannabinoid system, witnessing firsthand the systematic failures of the UK medical and political establishments, the arrogance of senior officials and the apparent corporate influence which all, still to this day, play a crucial part in preventing hundreds of thousands of patients from receiving the life-changing and often life-saving medicine. Now Executive Director of Patient Advocacy for the Medicinal Cannabis Clinician Society, Hannah works to encourage greater education and transparency about cannabinoid medicine for those that are still in the dark, and require a timely light to be shown on the fantastic, life-saving properties that cannabinoid medicine has to offer. So make sure and like and subscribe, and stick around until the end, so you don't miss out on the end of episode cartoon. Now then, Let's talk cannabis. Thanks very much for joining me, Hannah. It's a pleasure. Um, so many will already be aware of your story and your background, um, but for those that are unaware, uh, could you give a brief description of um, how you managed to get active in the cannabis sector? Yeah, I mean, it was very much thrust upon me. I have a, a son who's now eight, but at the time when he had started having seizures, it was um, eight months old when he started having seizures. So um, it was actually today, 27th of May, 2012, so it's eight years ago today he had his first seizure, so that's quite yeah. poignant. Yeah, yeah. And that 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 um, date sort of is etched in my brain forevermore. Although my partner says you can't, rem you shouldn't remember that, and I was like, well, I don't. You know, it's the day that my life changed. You know, it's the day that everything changed for us. Um, and we took him to hospital, and he was in hospital for four months. He was very severe. His seizures didn't stop with, um, you know, a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that they were throwing at him. He had um, an unknown condition, all the, all the tests that he had were normal. So I um, basically, we, in the end, the seizure stopped with intravenous steroids and we took him home after, as I say, four months in hospital. And then it happened again and then it happened again. And he, he, has, um, he had what was basically cyclical seizures because we were just going in and out of hospital. It was every eight months and we we're going in and out of hospital with these terrible seizures. Um, the only thing that stopped them was intravenous steroids, and he would come home, he'd regress, he'd lose all his skills. It was just awful, and, and all the tests that he was having done were normal. So, um, you know, that's the position we were in. And then at age five, we got a diagnosis of something called PCBH19. The reason he hadn't been tested for that is because girls usually have it, not boys. There's about 700 girls in the world with it, and nine boys. So he's very, you know, amongst a very rare group. There's no research into it, unfortunately, because or other than the PCDH19 Alliance support a very small amount of um, funding on, on research because it doesn't make any money. You know, pharmaceutical companies are not going to invest millions of pounds in looking for treatment for something for 700 people. Yeah. So yeah. when I found that out and our doctor said, you know, this is his condition, he hopefully might get better when he's older. Um, and other than that, we don't know. I just felt like actually I probably know more about his condition than anyone because doctors can't help me. I live with this every day. I see what it does to him. And what I did notice is obviously he was, as I say, he was responsive to steroids only. And I researched and looked at steroids. And what do steroids do? Well, they suppress your immune response. So we knew that his epilepsy was driven or had some relationship with his immune system. So I thought, well, and we kept being told by his doctors, you know, if he carries on having intravenous steroids, and he used to have up to five doses per cluster, so he was having hundreds of seizures, up to five doses of very high, you know, strong methylprednisolone plus other anti-epileptic and rescue medication. He was having all of that, and they said, you know, this medication can cause heart attack, it can cause psychosis, it can cause liver and kidney failure. And I just didn't, obviously didn't want that. And I got to, a, you know, I got to a point where I thought, well, I need to try and help him because actually we're just going in and out of hospital. We're not getting it, you know, we're, we're being reactive. You know, we're not actually doing anything to stop this from happening. Um, and then at the at, at age five as well, his condition got a lot worse. So instead of him being in hospital every eight months, he was in hospital every week. It just happened like that. And it can be to do with hormones. You know, epilepsy does change um, with age, with hormones, all that sort of stuff. So I was taking him in an ambulance every week into hospital with having hundreds of seizures, having to hold him down, get needles into him, him screaming. The older he got, the more he knew what was going on. And the seizures didn't knock him out like they did when he was a baby. 
And I was absolutely traumatized at this point. And I just thought, you know, I can't do this. And I, I remember quite vividly in my head just thinking, I've got to either sink or swim. Yeah. I'm either going to say I've had enough and I'm not going to do this anymore. Because actually we didn't have any social work at that point. We didn't have any respite. We were just going into hospital out. No one was keeping an eye on whether we were safe, whether we were mentally safe, whether we were physically able to keep going. You know, I felt really, really let down, if I'm completely honest, by the very people that should have been taking care of me and my child. And, and at that point as well, by the time Alfie was five, I had a two-year-old daughter as well, who thankfully was perfectly well, but still a lot to look after. Yeah, totally. So, in 2016 the winter of 2016 I just decided I've got to fight and I just thought if he does die I need to stand there saying goodbye to him knowing that I have done as his mother everything I can to get him to live a good life you know not this role you know this sort of conveyor belt going into hospital out and actually all the drugs he was given he had to wean off them so he was having three or four days of horrendously violent behavior where he would scratch me and hit me and punch me his father is six foot three and plays rugby and I could just think well that's going to be he's going to be six foot three and he's going to hit me and that's going to be dangerous and that's going to mean I can't look after him you know and I don't want him to go into a home or, and be looked after by people that I don't know are going to keep him safe so all this stuff was happening in my head and I just thought I've got to do something so that's when I took to the internet and I started to research you know how we can naturally balance the immune system and cannabis just kept coming up and, and I'll be completely honest with you cannabis was something that I knew at college you know where people smoked to join and ate too many Jaffa cakes and had a good time you know that's cannabis for me it was not about medicine and I was really enlightened you know I learned about the endocannabinoid system I remember watching some YouTube videos with David Nutt talking about the entourage effect and the endocannabinoid system and the fact that every mammal has it you know, every human being. And I, I just was so interested in that. I said, you know, why don't I know about this? Why don't doctors know about it? So it was really amazing. And then we just decided to try some CBD, which we tried Charlotte's Web um, with Alfie, because obviously legally you can just buy that. And we did that. And that didn't really help him. Although I think in hindsight, I probably wasn't dosing it high enough. And again, there was no help. No one would help me. I didn't, you know, I, I went onto groups and people... What I learned is that it's an individualized medicine. You know, there is no set dose for epilepsy. There's no set dose for pain. It's, it's individual because it's an individual system in our body. So, you know, that's how I sort of decided I wanted to do this. And at the beginning of 2017, I went to Alfie's doctor and said, you know, I want to use, try and use cannabis with him because he's so ill. And he said, oh, well, there's a, a trial for Epidiolex is UW pharmaceutical CBD only product and I said fine well can you get us on the trial um, he was rejected three times for that trial because he didn't fit criteria um, we even got our MP to try and get someone at Great Ormond Street Hospital to put him on it there was a flat refusal so at that point I that's when I set up Alfie's Hope our, our, um, I set up Twitter and Facebook that was our campaign and I just thought well I'm going to make you know I, I realized that there was thousands of families all over the world having connected with them through Facebook which was a great tool because there's lots of you know, medical cannabis Facebook sites I, I realized you know this is not a miracle cure you know my son will always have a very serious genetic, genetic epilepsy this is about quality of life this is about reducing seizures this is about keeping him at home and I wanted to try it. And as I say, I didn't want to just give up and say, okay, well, he can't go on epidural, that's fine, I'll leave it. No, because I've actually been brought up by my family and by my parents, very luckily, to, to know that I want to live in a fair society. And I thought, well, why are other people in other countries over to And we're not. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to do something about it. And we set up our fees campaign. We raised money. We found a paediatrician in Holland willing to treat him. And, you know, that that's, we took him to Holland and that's you know where our sort of journey of activism let's say I'd like to call myself a campaigner rather than an activist began so yeah so did, big, did, did you have to come back with the medicine in 2017 or yeah so basically what happened in September 2017 we moved to Holland the four of us as a family and um, we'd raised about 25,000 pounds through um, you know, doing media, but also my family did loads of fundraising events. We were very, very lucky and very well supported. We moved to a little holiday park in The Hague, 
um, <laughs> in the September. There was no one there. It was wasn't a holiday, um, and that's why we can cope with lockdown because we did five months on our own in Holland. So we're sort of seeing it as the same thing, <laughs> really. So, you already trained for it. Um, yeah, so we've done it before. So yeah, it was very frightening, you know, very frightening to go somewhere where we had, you know, a home, we had a lot of family support, a lot of friend support, we had, we knew the hospital, we knew the doctors, we knew the nurses. We were going somewhere where we knew no one. Um, we were very lucky, obviously the Dutch speak amazing English. Most people, even the waiters and waitresses in the shops, they know, or in the restaurants, they all speak wonderful English, makes you feel incredibly um, stupid <laughs> you can just about speak English but you know they were it was just a very welcoming lovely place actually and we you know we were very glad to move there but Alfie was still having classes every week so we went on the ferry as well I didn't want to fly I was too frightened to take him on a plane so it was all, it was all very very stressful on us and very worrying but yeah. on the 19th I think it was the 19th of September 2017 we saw our doctor at the children's hospital in The Hague and um, it was very, we were very lucky. We, we were lucky because we, I've got a Dutch friend who lives in the town where I live and she'd phoned these hospitals and found this doctor for us. So that, you know, I was just very lucky to have that sort of support. Um, we saw her, she prescribed Vegulite CBD, which is about 100 milligrams of CBD per mil and about three to five milligrams of THC per mil. She prescribed that and told us to start on 30 milligrams a day and every week just work up. So, we had to have a lot of patience because obviously as a parent that with a sick child you just wanted it to happen you know and actually it didn't happen it didn't happen for six weeks so for six weeks we were taking him into hospital he was still having the same protocol what we did notice is that as every seizure he was every cluster he was having sorry that the seizures were reducing and we sometimes didn't need to give him as many steroids so he was only having one dose of steroids not five so we could see there was a change but the steroids the seizures were still happening but when he got to 150 milligrams of cbd a day he went 17 days without a seizure which was just like a miracle yeah it was just amazing and um you know i think some people have criticized saying miracle but you know miracles are relative and when you're going into hospital every week in an ambulance watching your child have hundreds of seizures and praying to everyone available that he won't die that's a miracle having 17 days at home you know that is my miracle and I was just so amazed by this product and you know he had he was a lot happier um his even his cognition we could see he's starting to be interested in books and toys and before he wasn't he was interested in his sister you know it broke my heart that he didn't even notice her really because he was in this world of seizures and pharmaceuticals and his brain just opened up, his eyes opened up, and it was just amazing to see. So we carried on, and we were there five months, and our doctor wrote this amazing report um, uh, to show, and we had an EEG to show the improvement. And in the February 2018, we had about £5,000 left, because obviously we had to pay for all of his medicine and all his, because his normal anti-epileptic medicine as well, and obviously to live there. So we, we rapidly ran out of money, and I just, felt you know we felt as a family we had the evidence we had the evidence and he by the time we were going home he had 41 days with no seizures which was just yeah, amazing probably. absolutely amazing so um we decided to come home but we had to obviously take him off the um thc containing product because it was illegal so we did that and he became very sick again as soon as we got home and he was we were back in and out of hospital i did actually put him on a um, legally purchased CBD in the UK just to try and help you know at, at a higher dose to try and mitigate the effect of not having the THC and other cannabinoids in his body so he was going to hospital about every 10 days rather than every week so it was giving him some improvement but not a lot um, and that's when I met um, Peter Carroll from End Our Pain very luckily my mum managed a lot um, at home uh, for me sorry just to go back while we were away we had a very supportive doctor a very supportive nhs pediatric neurologist who who said when we went to holland you know if this works i will happily try and prescribe for you so we wouldn't have gone without the support we had support from our mp our gp our pediatrician our neurologist you know we had all that support because we felt that was really important and that dialogue with our pediatric neurologist and unfortunately in the december 2017 when we phoned him and said you know this 
is amazing and he's doing really well and we we sent him the forms because obviously at that time it was a schedule one drug and you would need a license to prescribe that um but if you looked at the schedule one licensing it was it was ba it was basically aimed at pharmaceutical companies because that's all <laughs> who, who had licenses for researching cannabis was pharmaceutical companies so we asked him to take it away and talk to his medical director about it and he phoned us a couple of weeks later pretty much in tears saying i can't do it i'm not allowed i've been told that it's an illegal drug i can't support you and i'm really sorry and obviously for that for us that was just horrendous you know and it wasn't because he didn't want to do it he, he was just being told he couldn't probably because of litigation and all these things all the reasons that it shouldn't be no it should be about what's best for the patient and especially as we did it with a paediatric neurologist in Holland who is a professional and it wasn't like we'd just gone down the road and knew something that was dodgy you know we were using pharmaceutical grade products we were using a doctor and yet he was being blocked from doing it so that's why we decided to come home because we realized that we needed to run a campaign we needed to get into the media we needed to fight this because we couldn't get our NHS doctor to be allowed to prescribe so that's when we met end our pain my mum had made contact with Baroness Molly Meacher, who is the um, chair of the APPG on drugs policy, um, and she put us in touch with Endar Payne. And I met Peter Carroll within a few days of coming home from Holland and um, told him what I wanted to do. You know, Endar Payne is a lobby group for medical cannabis on prescription. It had been running firstly for people with MS, and then they were trying to sort of help others. and. You know, we came along and he said, you know, I can help you do this. I can get you on the media and it's going to be a roller coaster. There's going to be ups and there's going to be downs, but we're going to try our best. And he wasn't wrong. I mean, it was just like a whirlwind. <laughs> um, on the 26th of February 2018 was my first, you know, big interview. I'd done some local TV and newspapers and things before we went to Holland, but I went on BBC Breakfast and I was terrified. I remember going on and just, um, the, but the, there was an amazing producer I met called Jilly who, she just said to me this is your one chance you know be open be honest tell the truth and she was brilliant and i went on and i did exactly that i you know i, I called out the hypocrisy why is it allowed in other countries and it's not allowed here why if we have the evidence that this helps my son is it not available to other to us on the nhs and and we did talk just about alfie and i think that's really important if i'd have gone out and said you know i think medical cannabis should be available for everyone they'd have just you know not been interested in talking to me I had to make it all about Alfie, but obviously in the back of my mind that it's always been about everyone. Um, and that day when we were on BBC Breakfast, the Home Office um, issued a statement because obviously it was the Home Office dealing with it because it's a Schedule One drug; it's not a medicinal drug, so we weren't dealing with the health sector. He that that was a, a statement from the Minister of Fire and Policing, Nick Hurd, at the time, saying there is no medicinal value to cannabis, and we will not we will not be supporting this or helping. And, and that's the point we were at on the 26th of February. In the March, um, End Our Pain organised an event for us where we met MPs, 120 MPs actually, who came and signed a letter of support, talked to us about Alfie's use um, of medical cannabis and why it was so important. Um, and then we went and delivered my petition to Number 10 Downing Street, which at the time had about 375,000 signatures on. It ended up with about 800,000 signatures. Um, we went to see, obviously give in the petition at number 10 and, and we were invited in, which doesn't happen usually when you say, when you take a petition to number 10. So I was with Drew, my partner and Alfie and Annie, because Alfie was luckily well enough to go. So I took him and we went and sat with our MP um, and the Minister for Foreign Police and Nick Heard and the Mike Penning, who was incredibly supportive as well, Conservative MP, very supportive of and end our pain and what we were trying to do and we were sat having a cup of tea and the door opened and Theresa May walked in <laughs> um, and just said I've heard about Alfie oh you know can you tell me about him and I did I you know told him about Alfie and I said you know this is about fairness you know this is about a medicine being available to my child that is available everywhere else you know in, in many um countries in the world you know and it should be available to him if it helps and we've proven it helps and she said okay well I'll allow your doctors to apply for a license to the home office this is the first time it's ever been done it's going to be a process you're going to have to create this this application basically with with the home office but I'll allow you to do that and that was an amazing step forward because that's never happened before and the fact that we had that conversation with her and she gave her support 
for our application was just an immense move forward for the whole movement. Um, and then we obviously had to find a doctor to support us and that's when we met Professor Mike Barnes who is a private urologist and was willing to do the application with the Home Office. We also had our GP who's incredibly supportive, our NHS GP, our paediatrician. We had an external NHS paediatrician offering the governance for the, for the um, application and we also have a pharmacist and an importer. So we were extremely lucky with an amazing group of people who saw that this was about Alfie and the benefit to the patient. This is you know, not about anything else. And they were very, very supportive. And, and Mike spent three months working with the Home Office to create this license application. It was ridiculously over the top. He had firearms officers sent to his home to check his home out, even though he was never going to have any product in his house. He was only the prescriber. I mean, it was. Jesus. It was dealt with badly by them, to be honest. But again, I think that all comes from fear. You know, they didn't really want to do it. The reason they were doing it is because we had so much media and we were so supportive. There was so much public support that I think they felt they had to. And what they did ask us to do, and the agreement was made with Nick Hurd, is that we wouldn't seek media attention why we were doing this process. I think in hindsight, I was wrong to accept that because I think that was another way of trying to keep us quiet. But, you know, I'm always of the, the mind that you treat, treat people as you'd want to be treated. And, and, you know, he was asking me to do something and I accepted because I felt that it was a sincere request and it was the right thing to do. I also feel the way you change people's minds about things is sitting, talking to them and, and supporting them with that decision making rather than forcing them into doing what you want because you think they should because actually you're never going to change anyone's mind by doing that what you're going to change people's minds by is actually educating them and helping them to understand so that's where i was coming from but unfortunately after three months we got to the beginning of june we had a meeting with our mp and with the doctors with the home office because there was lots of emails coming and going and we got to a point where we had the application done and the home office said the application isn't good enough and we said well what do we need to do and they said well we can't tell you because that would be doing it for you so that's nonsense it's yeah. never been done before so it, it was just ridiculous and so we had this meeting with and our mp was very very good um sat everyone around the table and we went through everything all their queries and at the end of that meeting the home office the head of drugs policy said yeah we're happy with everything that was the friday fine we'll have a and he said you'll have an answer on monday so on the Monday morning, um, I was phoned by the chief of staff at the Home Office and they said, oh, there's just a few more things. And I just lost my, <laughs> lost my temper. And I said, no, you know, you've had three months. You've had the, you, we had this meeting on Friday. We agreed everything's OK. No, I'm done. You know, they were just then I realised that I was being led down a path that wasn't, you know, wasn't acceptable to me. And the next morning I went on to um, the Today programme with John Humphreys and I took that, you know, I didn't want to have to do this because as I say, I, I've always wanted to be, have a collaborative approach, approach to changing the way things are for people. But unfortunately, sometimes you have to use the media. And I went on with this programme and John said to me, you know, what, you know, what do you want to say? And I just said, I talked about my meeting with the Prime Minister and I said, look, you know, I met her. She promised to help me. I feel like I'm being played down a garden path at the moment. There's no, you know, I said, this isn't political. This is about my son. You know, this is not about HS2 or, or a housing estate or anything else. This is about someone's life. And we don't play politics. We don't play games. And then I did a few more interviews. And then I, I was on ITV lunchtime news at 12 o'clock and um, she was interviewing me and she said, oh, uh, Sadie Javid, the Home Secretary, is just coming into the House of Commons and she said he's announcing that Alfie Dingley is going to get his licence. So, and I was on telly while she told me, so I was incredibly overwhelmed and it still makes me feel emotional now because we did it in three months, you know, from the first interview, the 26th of February, it was March, April, May, June, four months, sorry pretty much four months and we did it and I just couldn't, couldn't believe it you know I was so amazed and he also then announced the review into medical cannabis done by the chief medical officer and also announced that the, the, the process that we had created in the home office would then be a license application process for other families to use which was available until the 1st of November and then then the law changed on the 1st of November 2018 which should have allowed 
other people to get access on the NHS. So yeah, I mean, it was just amazing. And I feel very, very passionate that, you know, what is fair, what is right for my son should be right for everyone. And children with epilepsy, like my son, should be allowed to have medicine that they need, you know, and it shouldn't just be him and a few others that get it. It should be everyone that needs it. So that's sort of my my mission now is to carry on campaigning for that and, and for fairness. Since the, the law changed in November uh, 2018, um, was it the was it March 2019 that you went to Parliament again with another campaign um, and had 578 yeah. citizens? Is that right? Yeah, with um, with End Our Pain, I, I, I've supported em, End Our Pain obviously ever since because you know I don't work directly for them or with them, but I support their work and I support. I've made many amazing friends through that work. You know, many families that I. You know, I'm so grateful because actually when I went to Holland, I didn't know anyone with a child with epilepsy. I felt like I was the only mother in the whole world that felt like this. And whilst, you know, we still get some difficult days and so do the families I work with, some much worse than me, uh, it does bring comfort to know that you're not alone, you know, that there are other people that get it, you know, know how hard it is, know that it's frightening, know that, you know, you're worrying about your child all the time and it just brings you a lot of comfort. So, I, you know, I've... I, I'm very lucky to have been part of that movement and that that support network. And yeah, in March 2019, we went to Parliament with these families and we met Matt Hancock. Um, and Matt Hancock said that day that he thought that, um, you know, he'd been advised that medical cannabis would be available on the NHS within a matter of months. Um, what he was talking about, I believe, is epidiolex, and epidiolex is not what these families want. Some of them, quite a lot of them, have tried epidiolex, which is a CBD-only product, and I'm not saying it's not helpful and effective for some patients, it is. Um, but there are many children with refractory epilepsy who do need a, the entourage effect of a whole plant product. They do need THC. There's very good evidence that THC helps with refractory seizures. You have to get it right. You can't use too much. You need to use a lot of CBD, but they, it is much more effective. And actually, you can see that from the children that I know on full plant product are having an 80 to 100% improvement in their seizures. Whereas if you look at the trial data for epidiolex, it's a 40, 43% improvement of 50% of people, which, you know, is, is good, but it's not, not as good uh, from the evidence I've seen. Um, and that's, you know, because of the way the plant works. So, you know, we went... And, and we were told this, and again, it, it struck me that, and I said this to Matt Hancock, I said, you know, I think you're talking about something that these families don't want. You know, the, he hadn't been briefed properly. He didn't know what he was talking about. And, you know, whilst I take my hat off to him for coming to talk to these families, I still think it's a huge insult. A year later, nothing has changed. You know, yeah. we then also went to Parliament on the 5th of February this year with the families again and I actually at that point met Matt Hancock with Endar Payne on the 5th of February and I spoke to him and I said you know do you not understand you know these families children will be in hospital in intensive care unless they get the support you know with NHS prescriptions with you know even if that means they have to go on some sort of observational trial that's fine but you can't then you can't really move a child from a product that they're on that they're doing well on to another product that's not ethical we know that that's actually in gmc rules so you know i, I really tried to talk about then actually only this week we've seen that happen we've seen a family emma appleby and her daughter tegan you know <laughs> she was on bedrolite prescription she ran out of money she had to move her to epidiolex because her NHS doctor would prescribe that and she's ended up in intensive care in London having hundreds of seizures because you can't change a, a, a person from a, a, with seizures from a full plant product to a CBD only product and expect there not to be ramifications from that and that is not Emma's fault that's the fact that we've had lockdown families can't fundraise they can't raise money and our government is allowing that to happen these vulnerable children these vulnerable families are not giving any support they're saying there's going to be some sort of trial in the future, but I'm afraid to say again, you know, we have just seen in the last few weeks, they are expediting an antiviral for COVID. They're expediting a vaccine within a few months. The government have the power, and Peter Carroll said this to me from NDOP, and he's very right, the government have the power to do anything they want to. So when they turn around and say, oh, but, you know, we have to wait for a trial, we can't possibly do this, we can't possibly fund it, it's nonsense. They don't want to. And that's what really makes me incredibly angry because 
you know, these are some of the most vulnerable people in our society, very poorly children who, who do have limited life expectancy. And I'd like to see the government actually recognise that and try and help these families to access this product that will give them that quality of life while their children are here. And it, yes, it, it doesn't seem possible. It's just barbaric as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it is extremely frustrating. Um, in particular, the priority that you're mentioning here, it seems like they're not prioritising this situation at all. I mean, we're a year in, and um, there's still very little footwork has been done. And one of the things I've found noticeable is that often when they're trying to evaluate these medicines or trying to evaluate the direction they should be taken, they apply a select committee of advisories who have no knowledge of what cannabis is. They have no knowledge. They're, they're basing it based on the narrative that was given 20 years ago that had no knowledge of the endocannabinoid system, no knowledge of the, the phytochemical basis, these hundreds of molecules that independently do uh, uh, each different thing, but collectively, as you've mentioned, the, the entourage effect itself is something that's relatively new in medicine itself. So to, to think that political advisors will have any insight into this is, is just mm. ignorant, to say the least. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, if you look at the um, guidance, and, the, and again, this is the reason why we have no NHS prescription other than Alfie's and, and St. Peter Gibson in Northern Ireland, because one of the reasons is because, you know, like the BPNA, the British Pediatric Neurology Association, issued guidance in the July 2018 saying that THC damaged the growing brain and that they would only recommend epidiolex. And again, they issued it on, on request of the government after the law change, which shows, that, as far as I'm concerned, a preconceived decision already. They issued the same guidance, so it's not fair in that sense. They issue guidance saying that it damages the growing brain and, uh, and the epidiolex should be only prescribed. Well, epidiolex is only available licensed for two epilepsy syndromes, so that then negates everyone else, which is not fair, and, and adults, actually, because epidiolex is, is a childhood... Um, drug um, it also we don't have any evidence you know they say it damages their own brain but there's no links to any research there's one um, one research product that was done in, in teenage boys in America where they smoked high strength THC and the one and some of them had psychotic events if they'd already been predisposed to mental health problems well we're not talking about smoking high strength THC with our children we're talking about using high CBD low THC which and the CBD counters any side effects of that THC, but as you say, works in the entourage effect. They are twisting the narrative to frighten doctors and to frighten patients into believing what they're saying is right. And you're absolutely right. You have their nice, you have not the nice guidance that was created by doctors. There was only one parent on that group who uh, she didn't feel heard at all. You know, she was talking about cannabis to them and about the effect it had helped on her, her child. No one, you know, she didn't feel, she tried her best. I felt I'm so sorry for her, she tried her best. I was actually given a place on that nice um, committee, but I was told that I couldn't do any media or promote the use of medical cannabis for a whole year, which I felt like they were trying to keep me quiet. That's so a bit <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. I don't. I, I don't want to sit on a nice panel and then be quiet for a year um, to make me again to make me go away. I'm not going to do that, you know. So, um, unfortunately, you know, Nice created this guidance, as you say, based on a lot of people who don't know what they're talking about. All they were looking for is randomised control data. Well, there isn't randomised control data in a full plant product for many, many reasons because of prohibition, because of the fact that. You know, you can trial individual, you know, randomized controlled trials are based on a pharmaceutical model of single compounds. You can't randomize control trial a plant. You just can't do it because and also you don't have a set dose. Everyone's different. You know, this has to be seen as exceptional. This is an exceptional plant. It's an exceptional medicine. And we need to think about it in that way. And we need to create a way of, of getting evidence and knowing that it's safe for certain conditions. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying there shouldn't be research. I think there should be. I think I, we would, we need to understand all the different individual cannabinoids and how they can help. But I also think there's no point in reinventing the wheel. You know, this product's been used for thousands of years. We would know by now if it was used as medicine, if it was dangerous. Obviously, we know about the ramifications of using high strength THC. But I again think that that's to do with prohibition you know if we actually regulated what was available people would be safer you know so yeah. you know I, I, it's incredibly 
uh, it makes me incredibly angry. There's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of people driven here um, with financial interests, I think, with power, with, you know, there's a lot of other things that shouldn't be what drives you. What drives you should be the patient. You know, that's what matters. Giving my family and other families like mine a better quality of life. That should, is, should be what your driver is. But unfortunately, that isn't happening as far as I'm concerned. No, you're, you're completely right. I mean, the, like you mentioned a minute ago there, everybody's different. This is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand as well, is that um, the endocannabinoid system itself is very subjective to the person. So it's like, as you've mentioned, to, to take CBD and apply it to one uh, person in a clinical trial, say, and give it to somebody else, it doesn't correspond really because of the fact yeah. that these people could have a different uh, endocannabinoid system, the, the, the requirements can flow different, their health circumstances different, the dosage has to be yeah. consistent. Um, I think that's what's going to make this so difficult in the future as well for, for studying um, cannabis. And like often these trials, as you mentioned as well, is that um, they're single molecule trials which don't highlight the efficiency when they're in, used um, in tangent with the rest yeah. of the cannabinoids. Um, so it's, it's a very complex cir circumstance, but again, as you've mentioned, we've used this plant for thousands of years. Um, there is documentation documented evidence from hundreds of years ago it's been used for epilepsy mm. and numerous other conditions absolutely um, mm. i think it's just there's a there's a heightened level of arrogance i think because of the fact that we're in this very regimented structure um of society that we it's like well, we'll disregard anything that that, that predates just say 1998 or something you know and yeah, uh, absolutely. All, you know. i agree with you yeah absolutely and i think there's a level of arrogance that if something isn't through a randomized controlled trial then it it's not safe and it doesn't exist and we'll all put our fingers in their ears and pretend but actually if you look at a lot of drugs that children are given every single day whether they have epilepsy or not they are not licensed and this is something again that drives me absolutely mental when you listen to doctors on the news and, and they talk about kind of this say oh but you know we have to make sure everything's licensed and it's safe and it, it's nonsense they don't know actually they they dish out clobazam which is a benzodiazepine to children with epilepsy like bloody smarties and i'm sorry to tell you that they do and they can't get them off it i mean i know a family at the moment who had a child on phenytoin again benzodiazepine they can't get him off it and every time they try and get him off it he has hundreds of seizures because you get this dependency and you know if you look at the way benzodiazepines should be used they should be used in short sharp bursts to stop things like anxiety or epilepsy children should not be being prescribed benzodiazepines for years and years and years and that is what's happening at the moment and that hypocrisy needs to be called out because actually if we're talking about cannabis and you know we have to make sure it's licensed we have to make sure it's safe then we need to be talking about all the other drugs like that as well and making sure that our children are not being adversely affected by the long-term use of these pharmaceuticals, which they're not recommended for. And that's why I find it shocking that that is happening still, you know, to many, many patients that are very vulnerable. Because the thing is, what you have to remember as well, when your child has epilepsy, you're, as a parent, you're in a state of fear, you're shocked, you're worried, you'll just do whatever your doctor says. And then a lot of these families are starting to think, well, do you know what, is this the right thing? Is this safe? Is this licensed? And I think that's the problem, and this is where They've shot themselves in the foot because actually parents are starting to become enlightened. They've got the internet. They can read. You know, they they started to learn about all this stuff and and making decisions for their children based on information that they've learned and whether they think it's right. And I think that you know probably our grandparents' generation, everyone said, well, the doctor's always right. You know, that's it. The doctor knows best. And we're starting to you know, and I'm not you know being disrespectful to doctors, but they are professionals like any other of us. They make mistakes, they make wrong decisions, they're not God. So I remember my dad saying to me, when my son went into Great Ormond Street Hospital at the first, and he was very poorly, he said, just remember, they're not gods, they're people. And you have a right to say to them, this isn't right. You know, and that was really helpful for me because, you know, I think everyone just sees doctors as this sort of hierarchy above you, and they always know best. And they, you know, with great respect, they don't. Sometimes they don't. And as parents, we have the right have that conversation and to, to have a decision you know to make a decision on what's best for our children and a lot of the time parents are ignored and that's why they are turning you know other ways of treating their children through you know diets and cannabis and you know lots of other things that actually can help with epilepsy a lot as well you know as well as pharmaceuticals you know if the pharmaceuticals weren't there Alfie wouldn't be alive and I know that I'm not dismissing them I just think the long-term use of pharmaceuticals the health is not the best if there's other options like medical cannabis. 
That is a sadly ironic circumstance because, like you mentioned before, um, benzodiazepines in particular should be used as a last resort when there's nothing else um, is, is applicable. And one of the things you notice on NICE website and, and NHS website is that cannabis is used under that category. It should only be used as a last resort. It should only be used once there's nothing else left. And it's a, it's, it's a brutal irony, really, because the reality is cannabis, this last resort, in their terminology, is the safest method. Um, and it should really be the primary. Absolutely. You know, it should really yeah. be the primary resort. I'm opposed to this. And one of the things you mentioned as well is about these unlicensed medicines. And penicillin is a great example. You know, penicillin was, was given out widely and it wasn't, there wasn't studies done, there wasn't, it's because they've seen the efficiency of it as a medicine and yet cannabis mm. hasn't been given this same liberty, you know, and it is extremely frustrating, no. in particular for all the families such yeah. as themselves, you know, because exactly. it's not... Exactly. I mean, I think, why, why, do you, why do we think that's happening? In the days of penicillin, there wasn't the financial... You know, the financial ramifications of it that there are today and I think that's that's really sad again because as you say you know I remember meeting an amazing doctor from America when I was doing some interviews and he said you know if you give a child who has 300 C's a day a full extract plant cannabis product and then they don't that's evident <laughs> that is evidence and I you know they say oh but it's anecdote well no there's thousands of families all over the world using cannabis very effectively why aren't we collecting that data why aren't the NHS doctors the higher you know the high up doctors in this country and nice why aren't they talking to their colleagues in Canada and Israel and Australia who are prescribing because of arrogance because they think they know best all the time and actually it's so sad because I believe that, that you know there is thousands of people in this country that could benefit if not millions of people that could benefit from this medication but what stops it is all the things that shouldn't stop it you know as you say there's a lot of unfortunately there's a lot of lot of things going on you know why this is not happening and it's really sad really sad just a systematic failure <laughs> on an epic scale really um, you know, it's, yeah, uh, and it's extremely frustrating. The thing you mentioned a minute ago there, the anecdotal, that word is extremely derogatory when we're talking about cannabis in particular because this anecdotal evidence is essentially the determining factor if somebody is able to get out of bed or if somebody's able to go to work. You know, and this is what we're dealing with. You know, some people that will have extreme medical conditions and, and children as well. I mean, some people will have their entire childhood robbed from them based on the fact that they're saying, oh, no, no, but your benefit is anecdotal. It's like, it doesn't feel very anecdotal mm -hmm. to the person that's able to get out of bed, that's able to exactly. think normally. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that's and it, is, it is evidence. You know, if you look, I can't remember the man's name, but my friend talking about his David, David Sackle or something like that, he created the five pillars of evidence. It's worth looking up. I have looked it up. I can't remember the guy's name. And there's five pillars of evidence, and one of them is observation. You know, that is evidence. The problem we have is that the NHS have based what they do on a pharmaceutical model of randomised controlled trials. You know, pharmaceutical companies have come in and said, this is the way that you make sure a medicine is safe. Well, no, there's five pillars of evidence and one of them is observation. And as you say, they can say, okay, this is exceptional. How do we gather evidence? We can do it through observational trials. They can do that tomorrow. Why don't they do it? You know, what, what are the reasons? One of the benefits I think that's came out recently was uh, you mentioned earlier uh, Professor David Nutt, who um, is the, the founder of uh, Drug Science, um, who've done fantastic work um, towards highlighting the efficiency of medicines and other um, so called narcotics that are actually beneficial um, to the human system. Absolutely, one of them, yeah. And his project 2021, which is it's going to be a real landmark, I think, moment when um, the data comes in. Albeit it's qualitative data, but this is going to be extremely, I think, qualitative data is the most. Um, anybody can expect from cannabis-based medicine um, because um, the basis of looking at statistics is not going to represent the, the efficiency of what the medicine does. So I think it's at the end of next next year, I think um, that they're going to hopefully try and reach 20,000 patients, which are going to give a first-hand account um, of the efficiency yeah. of every medicine. And that will be something that, that will, they won't be able to ignore at such a large body of evidence when that arrives. No. No, I think it's fantastic. I'm actually a patron of drug science. Um, I was asked to be a patient for drug science about 18 months ago. And I, I know, you know, I know the people running the project very well. I know David very well. And they are, you know, amazing people. And I think it's an amazing project. I agree, you know, there's going to be some amazing data coming out of that. It, it's sad that it may take, you know, two, three, four years for this to move, but we have to try. Um, and yeah, I think it's, you know, it's an amazing project. I just hope that the powers that be at that point will, will listen to it and look at it and not be as dismissive as they have been, uh, you know, of, of many other things. Because actually, you know, when NICE were doing 
their ever, you know, they're collecting of evidence for their guidance on medical cannabis. I think they dismissed, I, you know, Mike Barnes will know better than me, but they dismissed hundreds of of trial data because they were observational or because they were in a foreign language. And I think they, they only took three three trials that were English, and I think they were all done by GW. And you know, it's just not right. You know, that there, there has been some really good small trials done in Canada. It, for example, the sick kids, they did a small trial in children with a full plant product and they showed great efficiency. You know, that's data and it should be looked at and yet it's ignored. And it's, it's very, you know, it's very frustrating. Extremely frustrating. It's almost an insult to the individuals that are conducting these trials in particular. The fact that it's done in a different country, it's almost as if the British model um, um, surpasses their model, so they're not going to regard it as something, as if they're not going to also yeah. be professionals. Yeah, that, that, yeah. yeah. That is, I think that is a lot of it. It's arrogance. It's absolute arrogance. It's we're British doctors and we know best. You know, I actually, um, you know, I haven't said this many times in interviews, but I, my first meeting with the Home Office, I took my report from my Dutch doctor which was a good report, all about our fee. And I said to, you know, the, the, the officials there, this report is from, um, you know, my Dutch doctor saying how well our is doing. And they, one of them picked up and said, but she's Dutch, literally. So that, you know, I've seen that evidence. They are, yeah. you know, this is the establishment that are running this country. You know, it's clear that they are, they don't, they're not interested. Although those people that I saw that day, they're not interested in what their colleagues are doing in other countries and they are belittling them. And it's just terrible arrogance, you know, because actually having spent a lot of time in hospital in Holland, they, they're way ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, that's, I was actually thinking that it's, it's, it's the worst form of irony. <laughs> You know, it really is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, since since you became active, um, you're now the executive director of patient advocacy for Medicinal Cannabis Clinician Society. What does that role primarily entail? Well, basically, I run I run the society, so I run the you know all the boring stuff. I do the memberships and um, deal with all the admin and all that sort of stuff. Um, but basically, as well, you know, at the moment we're looking at creating uh, patient information and um, support. So. You know, the Clinician Society is based on educating of doctors and other allied health workers. And I think that's really, really important because that's the way we change the stigma. A lot of this is, you know, 70 years of a great media campaign against cannabis. And we need to undo that. We need to make people, doctors, you know, professionals in the medical field understand the difference, understand why it's not like that. And, and uh, you know, we can't force doctors to prescribe, you know, we can't force them to do anything, but what we can do is educate them and enlighten them. And they may then make a different decision. You know, there's 26 private doctors in this country at the moment pro providing private prescriptions for medical cannabis, which is fantastic. You know, we need more and the private, you know, I want to see NHS prescriptions, of course, but I am also very accepting of the fact that that's going to be a long road and that's going to take time. So in the interim, what we need to do is, is ensure we are educating doctors who can prescribe privately and ensure that that product is as cheap as possible. So it isn't a two tier system. It isn't just for the rich. It should be for everyone. And that, you know, that's what I'm really focused on trying to help now. But my role in the society is basically to help them to, to understand the patient. I run the society, but also to help them to understand the patient. And we're looking at how we can create guidance for patients as well, because I get contacted all the time by families asking um, for this product. And I think that we need to empower those conversations they're having with their doctor. And a lot of the time, these families know nothing about medical cannabis. They know nothing about the plant. They know nothing about the endocannabinoid system. And to be honest, they're really busy looking after their sick and disabled children and they don't have time to be reading and reams and reams of things on the internet. So we want to make that easier. And so I'm, you know, I'm focusing on that project at the moment to try and help them to be informed. So when they are having conversations with their doctor and their doctor's dismissive, they actually have the facts to come back with and they have the education to come back with. So um, you know, that's a project I'm working on at the moment. But basically, my role is to support uh, Professor Barnes, Dr. Danny Gordon, who's the vice chair in running that society. We also put on a lot of events, obviously not at the moment, but there, we also have a director of communications, Kate Thorpe, who between us, we're helping to put on events and roadshows and webinars. And, you know, we just want to get the education out there and support as many people, um, you know, who want to prescribe or who are interested in just changing the narrative on cannabis, basically. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's, it's good because I mean, one of the things he's done recently is it's the, the roadmap for UK doctors and a direction in which he's can, um, they can go down in order to, to um, yeah. efficiently apply medicine. One of the things that's included, in it, well, several things are included, is the breakdown of UK regulations, definition of cannabinoid medicines, dosage recommendations, potential side effects, and also how to become insured. Because I think one of the things people forget is that um, with unlicensed medicines, if, if any um, GP um, is going to apply these medicines, they're liable if, the, if there's any form of adverse reaction with each patient. And that in itself, I think, is a, is yeah. a stumbling block that po people don't consider. It, yeah, it absolutely is. And they have to be protected. But I'd also remind them that, again, we go back to the unlicensed benzodiazepines. They are prescribing these things to children all the time. And they seem to forget that they are liable as well then. And it, I just don't understand it. It's like, because it's a pharmaceutical product, they think it's okay. I just don't understand that mindset because actually we have seen over history pharmaceutical medicines doing awful damage to yeah. unborn babies or to people or whatever, you know. And again, you're absolutely right. You know, people need to, doctors need to be insured, they need to be safe, but they, they are doing that every day anyway. And actually children are getting damaged by these drugs sometimes. I've seen it with, in a lot of the families that I talk to. They, you know, they get on these drugs, they can't get off them, all that sort of stuff. So there's a really great know. point. That's, that's, that's a really great point because that is the case that like you've mentioned, it's like they're, if they're doing it every single day, why is that again the stigma for cannabis, which everybody thinks every every person knows it's, it's, it's the least harmful medicine that they could almost find. Exactly. You know? mm. I yeah. think it's just the I think it's the word cannabis as well. I think if it was called something else, <laughs> people would be like raving about it. I think again it's this, you know, we've had since the nineteen thirties this sort of you know targeted anti cannabis um rhetoric basically to stop people using it so they use pharmaceuticals and that's going to take time to undo and but i i mean i feel very um confident that it will change and it will happen and you know people like mike and i will carry on trying to help that to change and i think it does fall in i think I, I, cannabis always has fallen in uh, as a medicine into this sort of new approach that many people are having to health so you know diet you know and people are realizing you know that actually i can control symptoms within my body through looking after what i eat and exercise and, and all that sort of stuff whereas i think that's been lost lots of time people you know smoke drink eat be massively overweight and then go to the doctor to have a heart uh, you know a, a tablet for your blood pressure i mean it's just mental isn't it and i yeah. <laughs> just yeah. i think that people are starting starting to wake up to that and i think that Cannabis medicine in his in his in its holistic form falls into that sort of you know health revolution that we're seeing quite well. So I think that I do have hope. Um, it's not quick enough. It's not good enough. It's never been good enough. Um, I am grateful every single day that my son has a prescription. Um, I'm very very lucky. I worked I worked incredibly hard for it, and you know I was just in the right place at the right time, and we did very well together. End our pain line, but you know that's why I do what I do because I want to live in a fair world, and I want I don't want to see children suffering with epilepsy or families suffering the way we did unless they have to be. Um, but it is hard, and it's upsetting that people that are in in power and let's say should be doing more for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, but you know, we can only try and keep trying and Thanks calling them out and doing our best. Yeah, that's it. If more people stand up, more people push, and more people are, are defiant towards what's been going on instead of being told, well, you can't take that medicine because, I mean, the reality is the amount of people that you hear on the media now that, that are doing trips abroad, back and forward, back and forward, you know, it's, the numbers are, are greatly underreported of how many p parents are actually travelling. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and the thing is I, I, you know I'd say again why do you family you know obviously it is cheaper now through private prescriptions but initially when clinics first came you know there were some families spending five grand a month on on medical cannabis for their children why if it doesn't work why are they doing that you know that some families had to the one family only had to sell their house so they could afford to keep giving their child Vegelite who had she was 23 years old and had seizures all her life and it was the only thing that's ever stopped them or helped them you know, in 23 years. Why, you know, would they keep funding it? And that, I think that's a big question to ask. And, you know, we're not, 
why do people travel to Holland to get it? They're not doing it for fun. <laughs> a lot of these people are sick, they're in pain, or they have poorly children. They're doing it because it works. And I think the thing is, you know, all the time the NHS and NICE can put their fingers in their ears and say, well, we're not going to do it. It doesn't work. It's all anecdote, all that sort of stuff. But it, the wall will tumble. You know, this can't go on because people, as you say, more and more people are coming to the to the sort of campaign side of it. More and more people want to use it. But my my biggest fear is is that a lot of them go to the black market, and you know that's really not acceptable, especially for children, because. You don't know what you're buying. You don't know what's in it. You don't know if it does work the first time, the second time, if it's the same stuff. You know, it's just not good enough. It has to be safe. It is extremely frustrating um, because it, it, since it's passed in particular, because you have got a situation where you've got numerous children. I mean, there's um, various individuals that have been in the media recently that, um, in Scotland that are paying eight, nine hundred pound a month every single month um, to, to to just allow their child to just live a normal life. Um, and this is at the same time where it's you, you've got individuals in the um, down south and stuff like that that are like able to receive this same medicine and it's a regional breakdown. That's that's the that's the basis. It's just that the, the region that they, in that which they live um, are not accessing it for whatever hurdle, whatever um, legislative hurdle that's in place. And it's, it's just, it just seems like there's this constant failing um, through every single step. I mean, you, you've described it well. Um, we've got doctors that have been disregarded and then you come across and then you've got ministers are saying oh it's coming soon it's coming soon and then it's not happening and then when it eventually does get passed through then oh because you stay in a different region it doesn't affect it that way it seems like this mind-boggling circumstance um, and when you said that there as well about going to the black market that's where to be honest self-sustainability is key um, I mean if somebody's able to produce their own medicine and they're able to um, and as you've mentioned the internet provides this fast store of, of information where it's relatively simple um, and, and it's real, and it immediately removes the danger. It doesn't fund private gangs. It doesn't fund any criminality. You're able to make your own medicine in the house. And, and this is something that I really do think that a lot of people should focus on, opposed to um, banging their head against a wall and trying to source it from somebody that has no care from, for their health or their child's health. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I, again, don't talk about this often because um, it's not sort of my fight at all. But, you know, I have no issue with people who need to be able to grow a few plants in their home for their, their, their sort of quality of life. I think that's fine. I think, you know, there should be some regulation around it, but I think it's absolutely fine. What I have a problem with, as you say, is people growing it who don't care about, you know, who they're giving it to. They don't, um, you know, they're, they're not bothered. They're putting other stuff in it to make it stronger. And actually what I would also say is I do get sick and tired of people saying to me, we'll just grow your own, you know, I would like anyone to say that, come and live with a child with severe epilepsy and it's a 24 seven job. And then you're saying on top of that, then just go and grow some plants in your garden and extract them on the heat and blow yourself up. And then the next time you don't know whether it's gonna be the same as the time before that, because we all know you can have the same seeds and they, they bring out completely different depending on you know how you grow, they can bring out different arrays of, of cannabinoids terpenes that sort of thing it's not that simple i think it is simple for people who say that because they probably grow their own few plants for their painful shoulder or something and they think yeah. because it works for them it's fine for epilepsy it's not it's actually belittling to say that people with children with epilepsy or actually anyone who doesn't want to grow their own plants should have the right to go to a pharmaceutical yeah, sorry to go to a clinic I have a prescription and that should be their right you know it, again it should be individual choice and I think again there's people you know from the grow your own sort of activism side of things that sort of really hate people wanting prescriptions but I don't understand why because it's our right you know it, it's what we you know it's our right and it's their right to fight for that but that's not my fight that's nothing to do with me I can't fight for anything what I can fight for is people like my son and that's what I do and I think that you know it's all about having some respect for people's positions and again that doesn't that doesn't always happen and it's very sad it's certainly not reflected in the media anyway and you're, you're, you're exactly right that way because right across the board as you've mentioned it's like you're dealing with that that, that people essentially it's like you've got recreational users that are being stigmatized you've got individuals that require medicine that have been stigmatized um, and you've got this breakdown which one thing i've found in particular since doing the channel is that there's a lot of in-house disputes when it comes to the cannabis community you're dealing with a lot of uh, stigmatized positions based in i'm on this side therefore and you're on that side therefore and it's really it's really frustrating because you're dealing with we're all in the same game here we're all just trying to make it much easier and it'll just make it a lot easier to decriminalize to follow um the path such as holland and, and canada and you know, in places that I've seen seen the light and they're aware, not only that, it's relating to people's health, 
crime goes down. You know. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And, and again, my um, you know, Peter, a very good friend of mine, obviously from End Arcane, we're good friends now. And he, I remember him saying to me, "What governments love best is campaigns that fall out," and it's so true. You have so much squabbling between you know people who should actually you know and, and the thing is you can't be friends with everyone some people you will meet who want the same as you and you just don't like them you know that's that's life isn't it you know we can't be friends with everyone but actually we can be respectful and we can be kind and i just i think again this is from social media social media gives people a platform to be rude to be aggressive because they're hiding behind being on facebook or being on twitter and I know for a fact that 90, 99% of the things that people say to people on social media, they would never dream of saying to them personally. So I always feel, for me, I mean, I ignore a lot of it because I do get upset by some of the stuff I see and I just can't go there. So I just let it, try and let it go over my head. But, you know, you should think about before you write things, you know, is this kind? Is this thoughtful? Is this the right thing to say? But people just don't. They just shoot from the hip. You know, and we have, I have seen it within, you know, some of the campaigning groups that have families in it, that they argue and they fall out. And it's, it's incredibly sad because actually it shouldn't be about who's been on the media the most and who's, you know, got the cheapest product and who's got the most on likes on their Facebook page. Again, it should be about the patient, you know, oh, and I don't, I don't care who, you know, does the most activism or who, you know, is the that's the most media. I don't care about any of that. I care about people and I care about living in a fair society and I care about people who are sick having a good quality of life. But you're absolutely right. It's the biggest, one of the biggest problems in the cannabis sort of cannabis um, activism, you know, campaign of space is that people just fall out all the time and don't respect each other's positions. And it's, you know, I, I, I have got to the point sometimes that I don't want to go on social media anymore because I just find it so aggressive and it's not fair. And, well, you know, it's not what I want to do with my life. I don't want to be worrying about, you know, what people are saying on social media. I just want to try and be a good person and help people. Yeah, one of the things that I like to say is that um, I'm looking forward to cannabis being legalised so we can all get on with our life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah. really, I'll just focus on something else, you know. I think that's uh, all I've got to uh, say here, uh, Hannah. Have you got anything you'd like to add before we go? No, no. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for having me, Connor. Thanks to Hannah for giving me her time. And thanks to you for sticking around until the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoy the content. I'll see you next time.